<laughs> so for the last uh, year or so, our theme's been Buddhism through time and space. Um, and over the last few weeks, we've been looking at Buddhism here and now, especially the sort of approaches to the Dharma, the um, emphases in the Dharma that we need to bring into our practice. Um, here and now, that are maybe a bit different from those that were needed in uh, perhaps traditional Buddhist cultures um, thousands of years ago, maybe. So, um, in our last few weeks on this topic, um, which, San which Sanchi Jyoti kicked off last week, um, we we're exploring some aspects of the traditional Dharma that um, sort of need translating. They sort of need translating. Um, if they're going to be of any use to us. So we've called this theme, our theme for these last few <coughs> weeks, it needs translating, it needs translating. Um, maybe I should start by just explaining what I mean by that, what we mean by that a bit more. Um, what do we mean when we say that there's an aspect of the traditional dark that needs translating to make it relevant to our practice today? Well, I mean, there's a lot in the fundamental dharma, especially the fundamental dharma as taught by the Buddha, as recorded in the Pali Canon. There's a lot uh, which is relevant anywhere and in any age, um, in any culture, in any time period, because it relates to the human condition. Maybe it relates to more than the human condition. Um, so, for example, we need to cultivate metta and positive emotions, <coughs> wherever we are. Um, if we're going to get anywhere on the spiritual path. Uh, we need mindfulness. The need for mindfulness is never going to change. The law of karma is never going to change. These things are there for all time, in any culture, in any age. In fact, if little green men on Alpha Centauri wanted to get enlightened, they would have to take on board the law of karma and the need for awareness and the same, exactly the same things. They're completely universal. But there are also some aspects of the Dharma that were a response to particular <coughs> needs or needs in a particular time or a particular place or a particular juncture in history. Um, and the way people think and the way people work, and the way people sort of um, think the world works, um, varies a lot. It varies a lot from one culture to another, um, from one time to another. So people come, people come to the Dharma with very different histories, very different backgrounds. Um, and sometimes the Dharma needs to be in, ex expressed in a way that meets those particular, those particular needs. Um, needs of particular people, particular culture, particular history, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And of course we live in a very, very different society, in a very, very different age to the one, um, to, the, the, to the, the societies in which Buddhism, as it were, reached its peak hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Um, we're very different from people, I alleged, people in the Indus Valley when they, the Buddha first talked, or medieval um, farmers in Tibet or Japan. Uh, we have a different way of looking at the world, um, completely different cultural history, our imagination takes different forms, different things inspire us, we've got different ideas of beauty, we've got different strengths, we've got different weaknesses. We can't just pretend that all the ways of practicing, all the ways of seeing practice that work throughout history are going to necessarily work for us. And I think one of the strengths of the approach to the Dharma that St. Rashtra has taken is um, that he takes that on board, he takes that on board very clearly. So part of Sangharashti's genius, I think, is that he's been able to stand back from the traditional forms of Buddhism. He looked at Buddhism over a wide canvas in many different cultures. He's been able to stand back from that um, and see them in this wider perspective. He's been able to stand back from the traditional approaches to the Dharma and ask, uh, what's this getting at? What's that bit getting at? What's that bit getting at? What's the spiritual purpose that it serves? Um, and how can we translate that? How can we get that same spiritual benefit uh, in our society, in our, in our situation? Um, so Sangharashtra's approach hasn't been to take the way people practiced in a time and place long gone and then say, do it that way. It's been to um, 
ask what were the spiritual benefits? What was that teaching getting at? And how can we get the same benefit in our society? Um, in, with our way of thinking, our strengths, our weaknesses, etc. And um, so last week, I think Sacha Jyoti talked about um, a traditional approach to practice that um, sees the spiritual path as about breaking through the fetters that bind us. I think I'd be right to say that, wouldn't I? Sacha Jyoti is here somewhere. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Good. 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 Um, so in particular, the three fetters that we need to break through to establish ourselves firmly and irreversibly on the path, to enter the stream, as it's called traditionally. Um, and she explored, I think, how Sangharash has sort of translated this teaching into language that makes sense here and now, how he's looked beyond the traditional language um, to the gist of it, the real meaning, and re-expressed that teaching in a way that's much easier for us to relate to and gives us something we can actually do, we can actually practice uh, in a practical way. So it's about moving from sort of habitual ways of being towards living with a clear and defined purpose. I think, would I be fair enough to say that? Yeah, good. I wasn't here, but I'm sure that's what you said. Um, and tonight I'm going to look at another really important way of looking at practice that arose a bit later in the development the Buddhist tradition. Um, and that's the Bodhisattva ideal. So I'm going to be asking, what was the Bodhisattva ideal all about for the people in that time and place? What was it getting at? What spiritual <coughs> purpose did it serve? And how can we get some of the same benefits in our practice? Um, we probably cannot see the Bodhisattva ideal in literally in just the same way that people did 2,000 years ago. Uh, and we just can't sort of pretend and step into their shoes. So how has Sangharachita translated the Bodhisattva ideal? How has he sort of looked at it and seen what he's getting at and said, okay, well, how about that? How about that instead? Uh, how can we benefit from it, living in our culture in the age we live in? So, okay, first of all, what was the traditional if you like, Bodhisattva idea all about. So the Bodhisattva idea started to emerge, oh, maybe 500 years, very roughly, around after the time of the Buddha. Um, at a time when some people seemed to think that the main, that mainstream Buddhism had lost a bit of its original spirit, lost a bit of its way. So in the Buddha's time, uh, the goal of spiritual practice was described in terms of becoming what was called an arahant. Um, arahant means something like a noble, a noble one, a noble person. And an arahant um, was generally described as somebody who completely liberated themselves from negative states. Um, this was the way that the main emphasis seemed to go along with the goal of the arahant. And the way this was expressed, as it were, mythically, so the, the mythic expression of this was that the Arahant had completely freed themselves from the wheel of life. They'd stepped off the wheel of life. Um, they'd achieved nirvana, a state of bliss, um, in which they were no longer bound to samsara. They were no longer bound to our world. Um, so they would never be reborn into this world again. At death, they would be completely liberated. They would never be reborn into this world again. They wouldn't just vanish. It's not like wolf, they just go out. But the state they would achieve is sort of mysterious and beyond our comprehension. Uh, but they would step out of samsara and into another realm. Now, a potential problem with that way of seeing practice is that it could all seem a bit selfish, actually. It could seem all a bit selfish. Seen in the wrong way, it could seem that it's all about liberating ourselves um, from negative states, escaping from suffering just for our own sake, vanishing into a state of bliss, and leaving the rest of you to get on with it. And, you know, you're suffering, well, that's just tough. I've got out of here, mate. You know? <laughs> seen in that way, this is quite, you know, seen in that way, this is quite a selfish ideal. Um, now, it's really, really clear that the, the Buddha never saw the goal in the, 
those terms. Over and over again, in Pali Canon, the Buddhist tells his people, his, his pe tells people that he, they should practice for the welfare of the many, for the well-being of gods and men. Um, I once had a bit of a discussion with uh, a scholar about this who said that that only happens once. And I, I got a friend of mine, well, a Mitra actually, so, uh, a Mitra who knows some Pali, to do a search on the Pali canon for those words. And he had pages of them. Pay, uh, in sutta after sutta, the words appear, practice for the well-being of the many, for the well-being of gods and men. Um, so he tells his disciples, the Buddha tells his disciples to wander and teach for the welfare of the many. Um, he tells off a group of disciples who have fallen out with each other, saying, you guys are not practicing for the welfare of the many. What are you doing? Over and over again, he tells people, he tells his followers um, that um, they owe a duty to the villagers and townspeople who support them. Uh, they mustn't waste the country's arms food. They've got to get on with it. They mustn't waste the country's arms food. Um, in other words, he's seeing the full-time practitioners and the people in the towns and villages who support them as part of a common project to raise the level of consciousness of everybody, to let, raise the level of consciousness of humanity. It's not just about a small elite vanishing into bliss. Um, and yes, of course, the Buddha did teach liberation. He taught a path to liberation. But he also teaches the other side of the equation. He also taught that we teach, seek liberation not just for our own sakes, but for the welfare of the many. Uh, we, we partly grow and develop to be of more use, to stop being part of the problem and to start being part of the solution. As long as we're ruled by negative mental states, by greed, hatred and delusion which sit at the centre of the wheel of life, uh, we're part of a problem. We're part of what, you know, we humans make a mess of the world because of, we're motivated by greed, aversion and delusion. The more we liberate ourselves from those states, um, the more we can have a positive effect. Uh, the more we can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. The more we can help others. Um, so that was what the Buddha taught. He taught that we need to grow. We need to grow as individuals, grow spiritually. Um, through you know, all the things that are taught in the basic Dharma, the way we live, our practice of ethics, our practice of meditation, reflecting on the nature of things, spiritual friendship. We need to grow through all of those to become more positive, more warm-hearted, more aware, more connected, more wise. Um, we should liberate ourselves from what binds us and use all this to help others to grow as well. Um, for the welfare of the many. Um, but it seems that maybe this second part of the equation got a bit lost sight of in some parts of mainstream Buddhism over the 500 years after the Buddha's death. Maybe um, the spirit of the original teaching was a little bit lost. Maybe uh, for some the goal was seen as becoming this detached arahant in a sort of spiritual ivory tower vanishing into a state of bliss and leaving everybody else to get on with it. Um, so yeah, maybe the real spirit of the Buddhist teaching had got a bit lost or a bit corrupted. Maybe the idea of practice is that practice is also about the welfare of the many got a bit lost sight of. Um, that seems to be the case because we, about very, very roughly 500 years after the Buddha's death, we get the emergence of uh, um, a, um, of a new movement in Buddhism, a new movement in Buddhism which seemed to want to get back to the original spirit of the teaching, to get back to something closer to what the Buddha taught. It was called the Mahayana, the Great Way. And if you believe um, Mahayana sutra, sutras, if you believe the Mahayana scriptures, the mainstream of Buddhism had got very tangled up in sort of an this quest for individualist liberation. Um, so the Mahayana taught a new spiritual ideal, um, which they said was a higher spiritual <coughs> ideal, a higher spiritual ideal. 
uh, the idea of the bodhisattva as opposed to the arahant. Bodhisattva means something like wisdom being or enlightenment being. Bodhi means awakeness, enlightenment, wisdom. Uh, sattva means being, so something like enlightenment being. Um, and they taught this as a higher goal, as a higher goal. Um, and that, that higher goal became, seeing the Bodhisattva as a higher goal became really characteristic of Mahayana Buddhism. So in Mahayana Buddhism, the Bodhisattva was seen as someone who practiced the Dharma, did all the things that the Buddha taught, they need to do to liberate, we need to do to liberate themselves, but they didn't do it to gain nirvana for their own sake, um, which the Arahant did. They, so they saw the Arahant as one goal uh, and the Bodhisattva as it, as it were as a higher goal. Um, so the Bodhisattva, talking mythically, the Bodhisattva did not aim um, to step off the wheel of life and vanish into this mysterious realm of nirvana. They didn't, that's not why the Bodhisattva taught. They, um, they became, if you like, they became partially liberated. They worked on themselves, they became partially liberated, um, but they postponed their full enlightenment. That's the word, that's, that's the, the language that's often used. They postponed full enlightenment uh, until every being was liberated. So they didn't want to step off the wheel themselves. They wanted to help all beings. Um, they weren't interested in nirvana until everybody could attain nirvana. So they existed in the world in order, uh, in order to help others. So whereas the arahant after death would vanish and never be reborn into samsara in this mysterious state of bliss, the bodhisattva would, be aim, would aim to be reborn in samsara over and over again for endless ages, for endless ages, postponing their own enlightenment until all beings were enlightened. That's the sort of original myth of the Bodhisattva. And there's a sort of story that sometimes goes along with that which says something like, well, imagine you're a fit, strong person. You're a fit, strong person. And you're part of um, a group of people who are lost in a dangerous jungle. So you're in a dangerous jungle. And in this jungle there are tigers, and there are robbers, and there are snakes, and there are alligators, and there are deep rivers, and there are really fearsome thickets you can't get through. And there you are, and there's you, and there's uh, this whole group of people. There's uh, women and children, little kids, babies, old people, frail people, sick people, and you're really big and strong and fit. Do you think sort this lot. I'm off. This lot are dragging me down. I'm getting out of here. Do you do that? That's what the Arahant seems to be doing. Or do you think, <laughs> or do you think well, I better, shepherd, I better help all these people to get out of this jungle? And if you did the former, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a much lower ideal to just save yourself than to, to get everybody out of the jungle, to, to make your aim to get everybody out of the jungle? So that's a sort of summary, if you like, that's a sort of mythic image of, 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 of the Bodhisattva. So the myth, this myth of the Bodhisattva, this way of seeing what Buddhism was all about, served a really hugely important purpose at the time. It revived Buddhism when maybe Buddhism had lost a bit of its original spirit. It revived Buddhism. It made it a real force in the world that spread into really major cultures like China, for example, until, in the end, maybe half the people on the planet were Buddhists. Um, most Buddhists who've ever lived have been Mahayana Buddhists, and the Bodhisattva idea is totally central to Mahayana Buddhism. So, the Bodhisattva ideal served a really, really important purpose for people at that particular time and place. But if we stand back from it, and look at it with modern eyes, we see that there's quite a lot of it that we really can't take on board. We really can't take on board, literally. Um, for a start, the idea that there are two different goals, the Arahant and the Bodhisattva, 
the Arahant who practices for themselves and the Bodhisattva who practices for everybody, uh, that idea really doesn't stack up, actually, that there are two goals. So Sangharachita has pointed out that the idea of an individualistic enlightenment that is supposed to be what the Arahant is, well, that's a complete nonsense. It's a complete nonsense. Enlightenment means breaking out of the bonds of separate selfhood, um, entering a state of unlimited matter, connection and solidarity with others. Uh, so the idea that an enlightened being would think, well, to hell with the rest of them, I'm off, uh, is a complete nonsense. You couldn't be an enlightened being and have the attitudes that an arahant is said to have. Um, so there was never any question there being two separate goals. And secondly, we can't really take the idea that the Bodhisattva postpones their enlightenment until everybody else is enlightened. We can't take that literally. I think Sam Rashtra has pointed out that this would end up with a sort of Buddhist standoff at the gate of Nirvana. At the gate of Nirvana, everybody would say, no, no, after you. After you? No, no, no. After you. And there'd be this huge crowd of people standing around the gates of Nirvana and nobody would ever get out. Um, so the whole myth, I mean, we have to see this idea of stepping off the wheel and vanishing from samsara into nirvana, and this ideal of staying in samsara to work for others, we have to see that as mythic truth. It's really getting at something really important, but it's mythic truth. We can't take it totally literally. Um, it is a myth. We can't take it literally that the Arahant would get enlightened and vanish, or that the Bodhisattva would sort of choose to postpone their enlightenment and hang around. Um, it would be quite stupid to take those literally. The Bodhisattva who practiced, you know, it would be stupid to think that the Bodhisattva was actually postponing their enlightenment by doing that. Because a Bodhisattva who chose to practice for the welfare of the many would be much more enlightened than a supposed arahant who practiced just for themselves. So, you know, the idea that the Bodhisattva is postponing enlightenment just doesn't stack up. In reality, there is just the one goal. We practice to liberate ourselves, certainly, just as the Buddha taught. But we also do this for the welfare of the many. Um, and the closer we get to enlightenment, the more the distinction between benefiting ourselves and benefiting others ceases to make sense, because the more we cease to see ourselves as sort of completely separate, uh, independent existences. Um, so, yeah, the, the invention of the Bodhisattva idea, if you like, or the, the re-emphasis of the Bodhisattva idea, it's an example of what Sangharashtra calls stacking, which has happened over and over again in the Buddhist tradition. So, the Buddha comes along and he teaches an inspiring spiritual idea which has got real juice and fire and inspires people. And then 500 years pass and scholars and monastics take over and it all gets terribly formalized and written down and there are hundreds of you know rules and um, it's all terribly formalized and terribly <coughs> formulaic and it's lost some of its spark it's lost it's lost the original spirit it's no longer it's now respectable it's no longer a radical means of liberation and so somebody comes along, a group of people come along and they realize that they re they're still in touch with the original spirit and they think We've got to get, do something to get the original spirit back. We'll invent, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of reframe it, we'll rephrase it in a new way. We'll say, it's the Bodhisattva ideal, you've got to be about the welfare of the many. And then we say, well, that's a higher goal than the, uh, the goal of the Arahant. That's a higher goal. It's actually the same goal. It's only teaching the same thing that the Buddha taught. So we start to get stuck now. We've got you know, the lower ideal of the Arahant and the higher ideal of the, uh, of the Bodhisattva. And then as time came on, time went on, the ideal of the, of the Bodhisattva got a bit sort of formulaic and whatnot. And a new ideal came along in, in, in the Vajrayana, the Tantra. And then you get various different layers of that. And uh, various different also ones in, in Southeast Asia. You get uh, various sutras that are seen as this is the ultimate teaching. This is the highest teaching. And people at the time, of course, had no historical perspective. They couldn't stand back from the tradition and see how these had developed one after the other. So they really thought these are 
the Buddha taught these, all of these, as higher teachings. I think in, in one Tibetan school in Lima, there's nine stacks, there's nine different levels of uh, what the Dharma is supposed to be about, all of which one is higher than the other. But the end ones, actually, if you look at them, they're very like what the Buddha taught, only they're sort of getting back to it. And you get that over and over again, this phenomenon of stacking. So we don't have to, we don't have to, we can, we can see historically how these different traditions developed. We don't have to sort of subscribe to the stacking idea. We can see that um, what the Bodhisattva idea, for example, was getting at was to get back to the original uh, spirit of the teaching of the Buddha. Um, so we can't take the Bodhisattva idea literally. If we did, it would be very unrealistic. How could we possibly, honestly, think that as individuals, all by ourselves, we could aim to liberate all beings. And if I was practicing to liberate all beings, I would find it quite difficult to feel really completely motivated by that, because, well, it's a big task, you know, it's a big task, you know, you need something to aim for that you can actually, actually do. So it's a bit unrealistic, and it's also very, very open to misinterpretation in our culture. So the Bodhisattva ideal came along at a time when people were very focused on, as it were, the inner dimension of practice, the personal dimension of practice, and they needed to see the outer dimension, the altruistic dimension. But we live in a society, um, whoops, we live in a society that, that um, does not value personal spiritual development. Um, not for its own sake. Our, cult our culture values work for others but it does not value practice that focuses on individual spiritual development. Um, people will often talk, for example, about meditation as, oh, navel-gazing. It's navel-gazing. Um, over and over again, during my lifetime as a Buddhist, I've been asked by Buddhists and not Buddhists why we don't do really valuable things, like starting soup kitchens. Why don't we do that? Um, that would be something worth doing. That would be something really worth doing. Focusing on helping people, that would justify our existence. Focusing on helping people to develop spiritually, well, that's just navel-gazing. Why don't we do something that really does something? Um, that's, the way, that's, that's the way our culture um, sort of sees things. If we just practice to develop and grow as spiritual beings, that's just encouraging navel-gazing. Of course, that is a completely upside-down view. That view in our culture is totally deluded. Our society, the, the real problems in the world are spiritual problems. Our society is rich and affluent beyond the dreams of former ages. We, we need have no problems of resources or resource distribution if people were living ethically, if people had a concern for their fellow man. The real problems in our society are that people are operating on greed, hatred and delusion. That causes immense unhappiness to individuals and it causes great inequality. Um, it causes the need for soup kitchens is a symptom of a malaise. It's not the malaise. Uh, Buddhism chooses to, 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 to focus on the cause of the malaise, which is spiritual, which is how we human beings see ourselves. Um, and unless we practice to liberate ourselves from greed, hatred, and delusion, we're still part of the problem, whether we run soup kitchens or not. I have worked in a, an NGO working in Africa where it was ostensibly incredibly altruistic but where people were still operating on greed, hatred and delusion. And the amount of scheming, politicking, and indeed a certain amount of corruption that went on within this supposedly altruistic um, uh, enterprise was, it just flabbergasted me. And it made me think, I am going to go and work with Buddhists among Buddhism to help spread the Dharma, because without that, without that basic um, spiritual level, level of development, even what sets out to sort of help doesn't necessarily actually doesn't necessarily help. So that that sort of idea that running soup kitchens is great, but meditation is navel gazing, um, is the way our culture trains us to think. So there's a real danger 
that thinking in terms of the Bodhisattva ideal in our culture uh, turns Buddhism into um, charity and running soup kitchens. Um, it all becomes about what, doing what our society values. Um, the danger of um, what Sangha actually calls becoming cosmic social workers. The Bodhisattva is a cosmic social worker. Um, dishing out cold charity without the fires of metta, without the sort of bonds that really connect us to others. Um, and it might even feed into sort of ideas of Christian self-sacrifice and self martyrdom and things like that. Um, this is the opposite extreme from saying spiritual practice is all about my personal spiritual development. It's the opposite extreme and it's just as one-sided. And there's a real danger that uh, we see the Dharma in those terms in the West. Um, um, there's also a danger in the Bodhisattva ideal of labelling ourselves as Bodhisattvas. <laughs> Uh, that can become a way of puffing ourselves up. So I'm a bodhisattva. I'm, look how much I help. Um, any idea, any label of personal attainment um, that we get in the Dharma is really subject to appropriation by the ego. It can become a way of puffing ourselves up. Look at, look at me. I'm beyond suffering, suffering. <laughs> <laughs> Once I quit. Um, um, so we can't take it literally, and it could be spiritually dangerous in the West. But, 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 big but, huge but, the Bodhisattva ideal is getting at something really, really important, really crucial about spiritual practice. It's getting at a catch-22 in spiritual practice. There's a catch-22 in spiritual practice, which says that something like, um, in order to get enlightenment, you have to work on yourself, which means you have to sort of focus some, to some extent on yourself. But if you're focused on yourself, you can't possibly get enlightened, because enlightenment is going beyond your focus on yourself. Um, Practising for the self for oneself is counterproductive. The very goal of practice is to transcend our limited, our delusion of limited separate selfhood um, and live a life that expresses our, our connectedness to others, our connectedness to the world around us. Um, if we're focused on ourselves, we can't do that. We can't get out of our focus on ourselves. <coughs> focusing on ourselves, getting enlightened, we're still focusing on ourselves. Um, we can't get beyond our tight little focus on ourselves by focusing on ourselves. I've said that about a dozen times in different ways now, but I hope you get the point. <laughs> um, getting out of that catch-22 is what the myth of the Bodhisattva postponing their enlightenment until all beings are enlightened. That's what that's really getting at. That's what that's really getting at. It's saying, forget about your own enlightenment. Forget about your own Focus on becoming the sort of person who can really help others. Focusing on growing and developing to become the sort of person who can really help others. Um, forget about your own enlightenment and start. St so yeah, you do develop yourself to stop being part of the problem and become part of the solution. But you don't focus on yourself, you do it for others. And paradoxically, by practicing in this way, by forgetting about their own enlightenment and practicing uh, for the sake of others, the trainee bodhisattva actually practices in a way that will lead to enlightenment, whereas a focus on enlightenment for oneself would never get to enlightenment, if that makes sense. Um, so the real point of the Bodhisattva ideal is that it tells us to forget about the self. Make our practice point away from the self. Make it point away from the self. <coughs> Grow and develop the self, but not for yourself. Go beyond the self. Go beyond the self. <coughs> and we here and now, we need something that has that effect. We desperately need something that has that effect in our culture. It's really important for us because we live in an individualistic culture, a me culture, a culture that's all, we're encouraged to make everything about me. I deserve it, you know, etc., etc. Um, 
We tend to make anything all about me. We tend to make the spiritual life all about ourselves if we're not careful. Um, so there's a sort of near enemy of the Dharma, which I think is really common in the West, which is the Dharma is all about me, my mental states, my meditation, my insight. Um, it's something I do in private to make myself happier, to enjoy more positive mental states, and it's nobody, it's nobody else's business, basically. Um, it doesn't involve everybody else. We might practice metta, but we practice self metta and not metta for others. Um, and also, I mean, I think we can have a t strong tendency for, to use spiritual practice as a way of bolstering our, our fragile self-esteem. So look at me, I'm, I'm so advanced. So um, just like, just like for those people 500 years after, after the Buddha, uh, who were maybe being presented with a self-centered version of the spiritual ideal, um, we, like them, we need a version of the spiritual ideal that takes us away from ourselves, makes, the, makes, the, makes our practice point away from ourselves, that encourage us to, encourages us to develop ourselves, yes, grow, yes, but to do that, um, but also points us towards something beyond ourselves. Um, we need something very, very like the Bodhisattva ideal in our practice, but we can't take it literally. And this is a point where I think Sandra Ashley has made over and over again. We need the Bodhisattva idea, but we need to translate it. We need to translate it. We need to put it in different terms. We need to see it a bit differently. We need to see what it's getting at, and then to translate it into a form that's going to work for us. And this, I think, is what Sandra Ashley has done. Um, so he says, yes, of course we need to practice for others and the world at large as much as we practice for ourselves. If we're not interested in, he once said he wasn't interested in any order member who didn't want to change the world. Um, we have to, we, have, we are part of our environment. We have to both constant, both focus on ourselves and the world around us. But we can't think of ourselves as bodhisattvas. It would be unrealistic and there's a real danger we'd get quite puffed up. Um, much better, he says, much better than thinking that I'm a bodhisattva is to think of the spiritual community as a bodhisattva, to think of the sangha as a bodhisattva, and ourselves as participating in the bodhisattva activity of that sangha. Um, so we think of ourselves as participating in the bodhisattva activity of something much larger than ourselves. Um, to do that, we're going to have to work on ourselves. We're going to have to work on ourselves. Uh, we, to contribute to the Bodhisattva activity of the Sangha, we need to be part of the Sangha, we need to help create it. And we need to become the larger, wiser beings we could be, as long as we're still stuck in our very sort of uh, our focus, our tight focus on ourselves. We're not going to make use of that. We need to get it. We need to focus on ourselves, but we also need to get ourselves out of the way to practice in that way. Um, and if we practice like that, I think we can genuinely grow into something larger than a limited individual. But we do that not by doing away with the ego, uh, not by aggrandizing ourselves, but by seeing ourselves as part of something much larger than ourselves, part of some activity that's much larger than ourselves joining with others to express a spirit that is, if you like, transpersonal, the Bodhisattva spirit. Um, so yes, we need to start by becoming an individual. Sangharashita is very clear that we need to become a strong individual, but that's not the only thing. Strong individuals need to be able to go beyond being a mere individual and join together with others in something much, to create something much bigger than themselves. So the image that he uses for this, which uh, I hope we haven't overworked recently, um, is the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara. So this very, very odd figure um, that we see traditionally shown with 11 heads and a thousand arms like this, um, and one pair of hands, one pair of arms, holding a jewel, holding a jewel. And the way Sangharashtra talks about this is as a symbol for the Sangha, as a symbol for a spiritual community, where the thousand, arm represent, the thousand arms represent individuals, all offering their gifts to the world, but all united 
in a common spirit, if you like, the Bodhisattva spirit, a spirit, uh, a sort of um, stream of positive volition in the world that, mo that <coughs> animates everybody, all united around that, uh, that meta, that uh, concern. Uh, <clears throat> And in this image, each arm is an individual. Each arm is an individual. But there's no loss of individuality, but they come together to create something much bigger than themselves. As individual beings, we're really, really limited in what we can contribute to the world. As a sangha, we can be real, we can contribute a lot. We can do a lot. Um, and seeing it in this way really gets us over ourselves. You, you could almost say that the Dharma is all about get over yourself, and this gets us over ourselves, actually. Um, without losing our individuality. So the, the, um, the image that, uh, or the analogy that Sangharashtra uses for this is, is that of an orchestra, actually. He says, he says some people would be scared that becoming part of the Thousand Armed Avalokiteshvara would be a loss of individuality. He says, well, if you join an orchestra, if you play the flute or the bassoon or the violin and you join an orchestra, you don't cease to be a flautist or a bassoonist or a violinist. You join together voluntarily with others to create something that you could never have created on your own. Uh, you all do your, you are your individual thing, you are a flautist. You become the best flautist you can be. No point in being an orchestra being a rubbish flautist. Um, you become the best flautist you could be, but you join with others to create something that is beyond anything that any individual could create. Um, so, okay, so that's, as it were, that, I think, is a Sangharachita's um, reframe of the Bodhisattva ideal. A reframe, um, I, call, I call this the Bodhisattva ideal reloaded, if you like. It's a, <laughs> But it's a reframe of the Bodhisattva view that actually is going to be much more effective in helping us get over ourselves and make it not all about me at the same time as seeking to grow and develop us spiritually. So how do we do that? How do we do that practically? What does that mean for us as practitioners? Well, we're saying here that the Bodhisattva that we're, is the Sangha. The Bodhisattva is the Sangha. So what do we have to do if we want to use the... If we want to, to bring the Bodhisattva idea into our practice, we have to create the Sangha. We have to be part of creating the Sangha. We have to be part of bringing a spiritual community into existence. Spiritual communities don't just sort of exist and you join them. You have to make them happen. We have to make them happen. We make them happen by the way we behave with one another, by being at our best, by helping others to be at their best, by being honest and open, by developing friendships. Um, we bring the Sangha into existence. Um, so at the first level, it's just we'll take on board that Dharma practice is about Sangha. There are three jewels in Buddhism and they're equally important. The Sangha is part of it. We need to be part of the Sangha. Um, we need to just turn up. You know, there's no Sangha, nobody comes. Um, you can't be a Sangha on the internet. I'm sorry. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be with people, real people, scary people. Um, you have to have your buttons pushed by those people and then get over it. Um, you have to work with your mental states. Um, so first thing we have to do is come, be part of the Sangha. Um, and we have to be part of helping to... Um, I mean, so, so at one level, okay, at the basic level, just being part of the Sangha, just being part of the Sangha. But we could see it as more, um, we could sort of set ourselves a slightly more um, challenging goal than that. And we could wish to actually contribute to the Bodhisattva activity of that Sangha. The main Bodhisattva activity of this Sangha, actually, is to go out to people, to go out to people and to introduce the Dharma to people. Navel gazing. Navel gazing. Rubbish. There are people out there dying because they don't have valid spiritual ideals in their life, living lives that twist them all out of shape, that make them really unhappy. And not a fraction of the people in Sheffield have ever heard of the Dharma or would turn up to a Buddhist centre. 
We, get, we see it every time we run a, a, an introductory class. People say, this has changed my life. This has changed my life. It saves people's lives. It's not navel-gazing. Actually, being a spiritual being, having a spiritual path is the most important thing. If we ran a soup kitchen, it wouldn't have anything like the same effect. So we, we save people. We save people by providing them with some really simple ideas about how to live, actually. How to live as a spiritual being, how to develop as a spiritual being. And we can all be part of that, actually. I mean, so you're part of that if you just give us a standing order. <laughs> that was the way the Buddha saw this original project, wasn't it? The original project between the villagers and the townspeople and the, the renunciants was some people had spiritual, uh, spiritual, some people had physical resources and some people had the time to just pursue the spiritual practice. And the two were part of uh, a community, part of a project to raise the level of consciousness. We can all be part of that. So giving in whatever way we can helps us to become part of that. Giving time, energy, skills, um, money, whatever, uh, helps us to be part of that. You don't have to sort of deliver Dharma talks to be part of that project. Um, Tibetans like to, well, many Tibetans like to think of the Dalai Lama as Avalokiteshvara, you know, Chandrasekhar Avalokiteshvara. And, but he's one to say, well, if I am, Actually, I'm just part of a big structure. If I am, then so is my cook, and so is my driver. Well, those might be, we don't have cooks and drivers, unfortunately. <laughs> Any volunteers to be servants would be fine. But, um, but any way we contribute, any way we contribute is part of being thousand armed Avalokiteshvara, it's part of offering the Dharma to the world which has a huge impact. It's absolutely what we need. I mean, God, sorry, I, won't go to, I try not to go into a rant, but our society is a mess. Our society is a mess because we've sort of abandoned one spiritual tradition and thrown the baby out of the bathwater. And we're left with, well, what should I do? Okay, let's just consume. You know, people talk about themselves as consumers. Well, what sort of view of a human being is that? But people are bound to be suffering all sorts of mental illness in a society that doesn't offer any spiritual values. And hopefully we're offering some spiritual values that people can actually take on board these days and practice. So um, that would be what I would say, what we can do. We need to work on ourselves. Of course we do. We need to, we need to meditate. We need to do the metabarbara to cultivate awareness. We need to cultivate, sorry, metabarbara to cultivate meta, connect with others. We need to develop awareness, we need to live ethically, we need to create friendships, we need to reflect on the nature of things, but we also need to see our coming together with others to create something much bigger than ourselves and to help that go out to the world as a crucial part of our practice. And I think that is the Bodhisattva ideal, if you like, for, for today, for us. Thank you.